The Secrets of Star Wars is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Hello there. Obi-Wan Kenobi here, also known as James Arnold Taylor, the voice of Obi-Wan. Jedi Master Plo Koon. And many other characters in the world of Star Wars. You're listening to... Shh, don't tell. It's the secrets of Star Wars. May the Force be with you. You're listening to The Secrets of Star Wars, episode 183. Hello there. It's a power that Jedi have that lets them control people and make things float. Impressive. Every word in that sense was wrong. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. This station is now the ultimate power in the universe. I find your lack of faith disturbing. It's against my programming to impersonate a deity. That's not how the Force works. The Force is with me, and I am with the Force, and I fear nothing. Remember, the Force will be with you, always. Hi, I'm Robert King, and you're listening to The Secrets of Star Wars, where we look at the deeper themes and meanings found in the stories and characters in that galaxy far, far away. This episode is another installment in our occasional series on the spirituality of the Force. Today, we'll be talking about the will of the Force, and how that relates to free will and destiny. Joining me on the panel today are Catherine Laffrey. Good to have you, Catherine. Hello, good to see you. And Angela Silana. Welcome, Angela. Hello. So, I don't know about you, but I spent way too much time (laughs) in my high school years trying to reconcile the Force with my Catholic faith. Mm. I had this whole theory about Force powers and the gifts of the Holy Spirit that is, well, probably just plain heretical. Um, (laughs) But before episode one came out, this big hurdle I had to get over was that Christianity believes in a personal God, whereas the Force is this impersonal energy field. And then Qui-Gon mentioned the will of the Force, and I immediately thought, well, if the Force has a will, then maybe I can just put an equal sign between God and the Force. And, you know, I was nerding out in the theater mm-hmm. there right up until he mentioned midichlorians. And yeah, anyway, um, <laughs> The more I thought about it, the more I wondered about this relationship between the will of the force, free will, the free will of various characters, the choices they make, what impact they have, the whole emphasis on destiny. Is the will of the force the same thing as destiny? I had all these questions and I thought about them way too much because nerdy high school student, right? (laughs) Anyway... I, there's just we get a it. T- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Been there. Oh, done yeah. That. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, I, I love this podcast because I feel like I found my people. You know? it's <laughs> yes, just, for it's sure. Just great. Um, there's a ton to talk about just in this whole area. But, um, Angela, you said you had a quote you wanted to share. And I think that's probably a great place to start. So kick us off. Okay. So I'm reading this quote specifically because a lot of times when people have these types of conversations, the goal that either consciously or unconsciously is let's solve Star Wars. And on our podcast, we've talked a lot about how not consistent Star Wars can be sometimes, not all the time, (laughs) but sometimes. And so I wanted to read this quote by George Lucas. He's talking about Obi-Wan, okay, at the very, very beginning of Star Wars. He said, literally in the third week of shooting the first film, I rewrote it and killed him. (laughs) When (laughs) When I went to do the second movie, I'd killed off the main Jedi teacher, so I had to create a new one. End quote. (laughs) So if people have a hard time with like, you know, Disney not having a plan or whatever, like, I just want to let y'all know that George Lucas probably didn't have a plan if that's what he did in the third (laughs) week of shooting. (laughs) So um, I know that's like potentially really scandalous for people, but. I just wanted to read that to be like, you know what, guys, this is a general idea. The force is like a general idea. And there are some principles that George based it off of. But ultimately, 
we're we're talking about Star Wars to have fun. So I just want to throw that out there. You're you're disappointing my high school self. <laughs> just, I, I, I want to solve Star Wars now, please. <laughs> It is what it is. <laughs> it's almost like you're saying this is just a story. <laughs> oh man. Um it it is and it's I don't know. I this is I this is one of the great paradoxes, right? Because it is just a story and yet it does have these deeper meanings and themes and things that kind of if if not explain they they unpack things in real life in our own experience and um and it's it's that paradox of a story is so like incomplete in itself but it opens up avenues to something deeper and more complete than itself and and i don't know maybe we can maybe we can have some fun and satisfy my high school nerdy self at at the same time I have a real world experience with the will of the force today. Wow. Tell us. Well, first <laughs> of all, poor uh, Patrick was supposed to be on the show today. It's but true. He was sick. And I was like, okay, I'll sub in. I don't know anything about these wills of the force and all that <laughs> other stuff. And then as I'm looking up stuff, it tells me to go look at the book you just got for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> so I read and went, this is um, from a certain point of view, and the very last story is the Wills of the Force telling the story of Star Wars, and I'm like, it was the Will of the Force that Patrick's sick and I'm here! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, no offense, Patrick! Patrick. <laughs> Yes, Patrick, the the Force created Anakin Skywalker and gave you uh, the cold <laughs> you're suffering from. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, man. From a certain point of view. <laughs> from a certain point of view, yes. Yeah. Um, yes, yes, none of, none of, nothing you hear on this podcast rep represents the uh, point of view of uh, StarQuest Media. This is all a certain <laughs> point of view. Um, certainly... Hours, yes. Um, <laughs> well, let's. I I don't know. Let's let's talk about some of the some of the areas in Star Wars that raise these questions. And and I don't know. I'm I'm a big fan of freedom. Um and and uh, Star Wars is a lot about freedom. You know how can we you know a, 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 you know win back freedom from the oppression of the Empire and so on and so. What are some places where Star Wars really kind of uplifts and supports the freedom of our characters? Well, I found a quote looking at the Mortis trilogy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so we're already going deep dive here. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, the father is talking to Anakin after Anakin has been, um, I guess... So the son, if we go back to the Mortis trilogy, right, there's the father, the son, and the daughter. The mm -hmm. father represents kind of like the balance. The daughter represents the light side. The son represents the dark side. And so the son was having this conversation, I guess, or experience with Anakin where he was sort of, Anakin was seeing his future. And right. And like a lot of bad stuff was happening mm. and Anakin was like, well, I guess this is the way I need to go because the son says that I can defeat this evil emperor in the future with him. So Anakin's talking to the father and Anakin says, I've seen what I become and I cannot let that happen. And the father says, and for this, you join him. Your destiny can change just as quickly as the love in one's heart can fade. Nothing is set in stone. And then Anakin says, but I will cause so much pain. And the father says, if there is to be balance, what you have seen must be forgotten. And he kind of taps him on the forehead and mm -hmm. Anakin forgets everything. But um, that really speaks to, for one thing, free will, but also destiny as well like what does destiny actually mean 
Um, so I think a lot of times we think about destiny as like the path that is set forth for a person from like eons past the beginning of time and that um nothing that you do can change that destiny um but it seems that in the way that the father is speaking where he says your destiny can change nothing is set in stone that destiny is really sort of where you end up in star wars like the ultimate effect of your actions it reminds me of that um scene in empire strikes back where uh luke is asking about the visions he's having of his friends suffering on the cloud city and uh yoda says you know difficult to see always in motion is the future mm -hmm. um and yeah it's there's a lot of um a lot of making sure that people have choices uh you know that that when you see what's going to happen in the future or when you you anticipate what might happen there's there's always a choice that's presented um like like i'm uh even going back to uh obi-wan and luke in in a new hope is you know you must learn the ways of the force if you are to come with me to alderaan you know so mm -hmm. it's it's there's a choice there um and ben you know twists his arm a little bit but uh ultimately is going to respect his choice he's not going to kidnap luke right yeah we have to make the choice and then in a way destiny is like final judgment where you see everything that all those choices led to forward and backward in time, that ripple effect of your choices. Yeah, I can't help but think of a really famous Qui-Gon Jinn quote that I don't particularly like because it sounds really new agey, but <laughs> it has to do with this, which is your focus determines your reality, right? Oh, yeah. So uh -huh. it's this idea of whatever you focus your energy on, um, is what's going to happen, but not. And I think like for us, we could say that's true to, from a certain point of view, um, mm -hmm. you know, that if you're always, you know, worried about something, um, I think George Lucas was pretty clear about this, that if you're living in fear or if you look at Anakin, right? Like he fell in love with Padme, um, got married, but then he, he wanted to possess her, right? Like he mm -hmm. wanted to not lose her. And so he pursued this control over life and death out of fear. And ultimately, you know, he lost her and he was worse off because he just needed to satiate that desire for control. Like I mm -hmm. lost this, now I need more control. I need more control. So that was his focus was the fear that he had and thinking that control and power would lead to, you know, his being satisfied and fulfilled, where in reality, his focus determined his reality, right? Like his reality ended up being a really broken person in many, many, you know, aspects. Um, he never found that satisfaction and fulfillment until he let go of that fear, right? Yeah, the tighter he had his grip on, I have to not lose her, the worse the situation got. You know, you can't, you can't force someone to stay. You can't force someone to stay alive. And so the more he held on, the worse it got. And he ended up fulfilling his own nightmare. And he was the one who caused her heart to break and die and... So yeah, he, he, he made his worst fear come to life in trying to hold on. And then it wasn't until he finally 
gave up his own life literally to Mm -hmm. save his son that he realized that you know self-sacrifice is greater than trying to hold on and have all that power it's like trying to hold on to your own freedom at the at the uh by means of taking away other people's freedom Taking away mm-hmm. Padme's freedom, taking away right. yeah. uh, Obi Wan's freedom, taking away Luke's freedom. Ultimately, his is the only freedom that's being limited. Right, and I think a lot of times we are very tempted with this idea that that life should just be this nice, nice, neat little package, right? That is in control, quote unquote, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and when things don't go the way that we expect or, you know, when, especially when we have situations that are surprises and not fun, then Mm -hmm. we are tempted towards uh, thinking perhaps that, yeah, the more that I can think I have control, the more that that idea of a one particular destiny for everything becomes very, or not destiny, I should say plan. When one particular okay. plan, um, you know, that, that idea becomes very enticing. Not in the sense of like God's plan, but in the sense of um, this is the way things should be, period, end of story. And that all relies on the idea of control. Um, yeah, I'm sort of dovetailing into other areas of like our conversation of like God's will and all that. And I'm very, <laughs> I'm very tempted to go <laughs> in many different directions right now, but. Let's yeah, just say we on, have that free will. There's, yeah, you do not have the freedom to, to go into other parts of the conversation. <laughs> we have a destiny for this podcast. <laughs> I think that's the beauty of free will is that God gives us that opportunity to explore different avenues of fulfilling his will. You know, Mm -hmm. that God writes straight with crooked lines thing. And um, just knowing how everything all interweaves together. I, this took me right to a quote from mother Angelica, the best on God's will. I love her, her little things where she said, people often ask me, How do you know whether something is God's will in your life? I say, ask me next year, then we'll know whether it's God's will. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, you got to try it. You got to see where it goes. If you're not breaking commandments, if it's not hurting your family, if it's not, you know, ruining your life, then maybe this is the direction God wants you to go. But then you never know when he's going to say, okay, you did this good, but now we're going to go a different direction. I think there was a Mm -hmm. story about, um, I think it was an American saint who was called to either build a hospital or a school. And when it was completed, it burnt down. Mm. And she was like, all right, God's will. We we did what we were supposed to do. Now what's next? And it's just, there you go. Mm. What's next? (laughs) Or, or even like uh, the stories of St. Francis, you know, he, he heard God's voice tell him, rebuild my church. And so he went out and started collecting rocks and building the walls of this broken down church. Um, and then he later came to realize, oh, no, that's, I misunderstood in a way. But his faithfulness in doing that prepared him for a, a, a different, a, a greater kind of rebuilding. Um, mm-hmm. So he was right from a certain point of view. From a certain point of view. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I was rewatching uh, some episodes of the Clone Wars um, because, because why not? And um, <laughs> Yoda is, is sort of following the voice of Qui-Gon Jinn and, and is trying to figure out uh, who the Sith Lord is that's behind all of the nonsense and um he's flying toward this uh glowing cloud of of light and dust and maybe there's a planet in the middle of it and he doesn't know 
and R2's with him, and R2's sensors can't detect anything. They're completely clouded, and something kind of takes con- the controls from Yoda and starts flying his ship in. And Yoda says to R2, controlling this, are you? And and uh, R2 says, no, it's not me. Um, I, I don't speak R2, so I, I apologize for that. But, are you sure um, you start singing, Jesus, take the wheel? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, in a sense... Um, that's exactly what Yoda did. He said, you know, all right, I will I will trust the force to guide us and let go of the controls of the ship. And um I, I gosh, this goes for again right back to the beginning. You know, turn off your targeting computer, Luke. Use the force. It reminds me of Turret Turret Mway, where, you know, he's saying, I'm one with the force and the force is with me as oh, he's yeah. trying to you know, cross the field of battle and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's like ultimate trust, you know, in, in the force. Right. Yeah. The first time he uses that phrase, you know, I'm one with the force, the force is with me and I fear nothing. Mm. Mm-hmm. And yeah, when you have no fear, then you have complete freedom. Isn't that what, uh, George Lucas said, is that the light side of the force, you have that joy, that self-surrender, that self-giving, and mm-hmm. then no fear. Yeah. And, um, oh gosh, I want to say it's the first letter of St. John. Um, maybe it's the second, I don't know. Anyway, it's in the Bible. Um, <laughs> <laughs> perfect love. You know, the, there's no fear in love, mm-hmm. but perfect love casts out all fear. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, we sell Star Wars. <laughs> no, okay, yep, there you Star go. Wars <laughs> <all>. Next. <laughs> Next. <laughs> it's easy. <laughs> I, I mean, but there is there is this this paradox. So going back to the example you brought up first, Angela, um, where Anakin is with the father and he has this vision of himself becoming Darth Vader and bringing such havoc and destruction to the galaxy. And the father says, you cannot remember this and takes away that memory and takes away Anakin's, in a sense, Anakin's ability to make an informed choice. Takes that away or, or restores it. Well, I feel like it would have been better if Anakin would have remembered that. Yeah. Well, well maybe, been, maybe not. I mean, it's, <laughs> it could have been freaked a self-fulfilling out with his prophecy. Dreams. Yeah. Right? Like if he knew, if he knew it. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, there's very much the sense that these things are going to happen one way or another. Um, you know, war is going to take the galaxy. The Jedi are going to be destroyed. The In the, in the episodes of the Clone Wars that I was talking about, um, the the main plot was Yoda has to prepare himself to become one with the force after death because he's going to die and his mission is not done. He, he has to continue his mission after he's dead. Yeah, there's this sense that, you know, there so much of the events of the story, um, and I suppose we can you know, extrapolate the events of our lives are completely out of our control and they're going to happen one way or another. You know, what good is our, what good is our free will? What good, what difference does it make when we make a choice? You know, it seems like Anakin was going to become Darth Vader no matter what. Hmm. Is there anything Ahsoka could have done to bring him back? Is there anything that, Obi-Wan or Yoda or anybody could have done to bring him back. Well, it seems like the whole argument of the of the story is no, he is he is destined to fall to evil even if eventually he returns to the light. Yeah, I disagree with that. I would say Oh good. <laughs> <laughs> so when, Angela. <laughs> when when you're talking about like the the Mortis example that I gave um, you can interpret that as happening outside of time because 
when he and Obi-Wan sort of return back to the timeline, quote unquote, in mm-hmm. space, <laughs> um, they like no time has passed whatsoever. So if you think about it from a perspective of being outside of time, like in an eternal moment, and just sort of looking over the course of your life, then you would be present to both the past, the present, the past and the future, as well mm-hmm. as the present. So I wouldn't say that it's necessarily like, oh, look, these things are supposed to happen. But rather, you could say these things are going to happen in the sense that you haven't experienced them yet, but they have happened or are happening or whatever in the eternal now, right? So that's like a metaphysical (laughs) sort of thing. But I think, yes, Anakin could have changed if he had learned the lesson through some other means and the lesson that we just discussed of his desire for holding on to things, holding on to power as an answer to fear. Mm -hmm. Um, I think if, if there was some other experience that he had that was really impactful in his life, maybe with Ahsoka, maybe not, but in all likelihood, probably that would be one of the people that could have, you know, impacted him in such a profound way that I think there there would have been a possibility that he could have not become Vader. Yeah. Like he was always the chosen one, but he didn't have to necessarily fulfill it in the fall that he had. Yeah. Because you look at his life and how manipulated it was. I even, to this day, there's got to be a story out there. I feel like his mom being kidnapped by the sand people and being tortured in a way that they said is not normal for the sand people was set up. Mm. And I have always Mm. waited for someone to give me that little extra story where it's like, you know, I feel like Palpatine had something to do with that. Mm. He was always manipulating him and putting him in a situation to help him down that slippery slope. There was always some way that he was being pushed in a direction that he didn't necessarily want to go. I mean, right down to the last moment of, you know, who do I side with? Do I side with Mace Windu or do I side with, you know, Palpatine? And so you see him having to make that final choice that set him on the path that really had him go to the dark side. So it's, it's interesting to see, like, there's so many outs. And then you get his relationship with Ahsoka and you think, oh, my goodness, there were so many outs. I, went, I need a what if scenario. How would he have <laughs> fulfilled being the chosen one had he not gone to the dark side and become Darth Vader? I think he was already the chosen one before he threw the emperor off the <laughs> over the handrails. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. The because, only handrails in Star Wars, yes. <laughs> <laughs> because, well, the one theory that I've heard is that Darth Plagueis and Darth Sidious um, cre- working with such dark side evil um, created kind of like this imbalance already. And because of that, the Force created this vergence which was Anakin Skywalker Mm -hmm. on the light side in order to bring balance to the force. So according to that, I guess, theory, um, potentially you could argue that just simply because he was a virgin in the force um, as a response to all that Sidious was doing, you could argue that, that he was already bringing balance to the force but you know if he hadn't if he had just stayed Darth Vader I think that would have thrown the balance off even more you know Mm -hmm. so so um yeah he because he became Darth Vader then being the chosen one it's almost like the will of the force quote unquote was to bring balance therefore he had to in a sense it was the will of the force for him to throw the emperor off the over the handrails (laughs) so and yet i mean 
that also seems to play into the i mean i'm i'm not entirely sure how they're connecting the dots between return of the jedi and rise of skywalker but you know this this whole kind of immortality through subsuming all of the sith into oneself and that requiring the death of this particular body and um i've seen some interpretations or or i should say reinterpretations of the return of the jedi throne room scene which essentially set up palpatine as seeking that kind of of um fate <laughs> Yeah, um, you know, strike me down with all mm-hmm. your hatred and your path to the dark side will be complete. And and Palpatine's path to immortality will be complete. Interesting. Yeah, it's... <laughs> I, I guess, I mean, again, you know, we were saying, is it is it absolute that Anakin would have become Vader? Well, is it absolute that... You know, I, I get well, this in a sense goes back to what does it mean to be the chosen one? And we already did an mm-hmm. episode on that. So, um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, you know, is it absolute that Anakin was and was going to be the chosen one was going to bring balance to the force in this way? And it, when it really took Luke and Ray and Ben yeah. Solo to bring about an end to the threat of Palpatine and and probably Plagueis as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so yeah, like... Now that you threw those in, I got all confused. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here. That's my job here. <laughs> I'm the host. I'm here to keep things muddy. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so I'm th- like... Can we talk about the will of the force? Because to me, the will of the force is um, not necessarily a personal will, but more of like, kind of like how you see nature or um, creatures, you know, or even like amoeba, <laughs> like have certain mm. things that they just do, right? And it's sort of built into them that that's what they do. So like, to me, the will of the force is to have balance. That's sort of like, that seems to be the theme that there must be balance, even though, I don't know. I mean, George didn't finish. He didn't do a sequel trilogy, you know, himself. So we don't know what ultimately he would have done um to flesh out that idea of the will of the force but it just seems to me that there is a lot of talk about balance and that the chosen one prophecy being he will bring balance to the force oh that sort of implies that that's the ultimate good right is to like bring balance to the force so in my mind then what do we mean by the will of the force? Well, not necessarily a personal will, a choice that the force says, hey, we need more good in the in the universe, but that it just sort of does that. Like, so that's The will why... of the sun is to shine. The will of a tree is to yeah. grow. The will of the force is to find balance. Yeah. Okay, okay. I can get on board with that. <laughs> then you throw all that together with the midichlorians. Yeah. So like George... George said the midichlorians are the ones that communicate with the wills. And the wills, in a general sense, they are the force. The so wills, like, these are the W-H-I-L-L-S. Yes, yes. Yes, okay. Okay. I was so hoping then, we would bring these guys in. Uh, <laughs> yes, the wills. They're much funnier in the book. Um, <laughs> so he said the, the wills um, to be microscopic single cell life forms who are essentially God. And right away I went, oh, wait, that reminds me of something. You guys heard of the God molecule? Mm, yes. So it's, um, oh, it's a protein called laminin. 
and it looks like a cross. Mm-hmm. And it's okay. the binding protein that holds everything in your body together. Without it, you're, you would just fall apart. And so people say that it's like this is God binds everything together. So you can think of like the midichlorians are like the God molecule in the <laughs> Star Wars universe. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they, yeah. they certainly, I mean, as, as, as he developed the idea, he, he definitely said that they are, they are what bind the living force to the cosmic force. Um, and the midichlorians, boy, the midichlorians. Yes. Yeah. Um, and again, I'm drawing on, I'm drawing on those episodes of, of <laughs> Clone Wars that I just watched. It's, it's. Yay, I watched the right episodes. Um, <laughs> um yeah, the, they they are sort of generated at this um wellspring of life in the center of the galaxy. And whenever anything um and and they sort of fuel the transfer of the living force into the cosmic force and the cosmic force back into the into the life of the galaxy, which generates the living force. And, and it, it's this kind of constant recycling. Um, so that whenever anything dies, it becomes part of the living or it becomes part of the cosmic force. And whenever anything comes into new life, it becomes part of the living force. And the midichlorians are somehow the, the means by which this exchange happens. Yeah, I I think George compared the midichlorians to like uh, mitochondria, and the mitochondria yeah. are sort of like um, like the powerhouses in our cells, and mm-hmm. so they sort of they sort of generate, they make stuff happen. In other words, it's like the wills are sort of like whispering to the midichlorians, and then the midichlorians are the ones that actually do the do the thing. You know, make it happen. <laughs> yeah. We're all controlled by little bugs. Okay. <laughs> well, and that's I the that thing. Was a Star it's Trek like, episode. Are we controlled or <laughs> oh, not? Because yeah, no. <laughs> it's like, I know George has also said, well, the, the force controls us, but also we can control the force. So it's... Yeah. It's that's why it's sort of not a personal you don't really have like a personal relationship with the force like you would with, you know, God, the personal God, like in the Christian tradition. Mm -hmm. So it's like there's a big circle of life and that's going to happen no matter what. But within that great circle of life, we have choices of how we are going to live and those choices are important because we either contribute to the balance or we uh, get in the way of the balance. We throw off the balance. Is that, is that kind of the direction we're going at the moment? Yeah, I think so. (laughs) So how does this fit in with, with our Christian notions of God's will and God's plan for us and so on? Um, because there's a sense in which, you know, you could, you could very much say a lot of the same things about the Christian notion of God. You know, we, we believe that God created the entire world and set us free in the midst of it. And, um, you know, we we will live, we will die, we will, um, we will face, uh, judgment based on did we go along with his will or did we get in the way of his will? And, and, um, I don't know. Am I, am I, am I, am I going back to my high school self and falling into heresy in order to <laughs> reconcile the two things I love? <laughs> yeah. yeah. The will is an interesting thing. You know, the permissive will that we have, we're allowed yeah. to make our choices, but then, our choices have effect for good or ill. That's what will be revealed to us in our, you know, final judgment. You know, you see that interaction of how well we stayed with God's will or 
our own will and see how it all fits together. It's interesting because it made me think um, also about Marian apparitions when she would say, please, I need people to be praying the rosary. Otherwise, X, Y, or Z could happen or these things mm -hmm. will happen. And then it's like, wait, does that mean we can change the path of history by our prayer is you know what if we don't what's going to happen what what if only some people do and some people don't you know how many people does it take so it makes you just yeah you know, wonder how it all fits together although i'm glad that i don't actually know the details because my head would probably explode if i didn't know <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> like exactly how many people needed to pray the rosary or whatever for like this thing that like if that was actually a thing in my head like i don't think i could like take it yeah i mean it, it feels like it's reducing grace to like a machine yeah it's like right. you know you, you you put so many coins in the slot and you get x result and and if there's one thing we know about god and grace and the world it's that it doesn't work that way it's not mm -hmm. mechanical in that way and and yeah. i think this is something that you know we get out of star wars too is, is you know the force is not mechanical it's there's always something surprising and mysterious about it and and um and i appreciate that yeah um to to your initial question about like how this jibes with um our faith uh all this star wars stuff <laughs> um <laughs> i i went to go look up the word destiny in the catechism of the catholic church <laughs> and okay. believe it or not it comes up like several times like mm -hmm. more than 10 but um i thought it was interesting like a couple of quotes there's one from um, number 311 that says angels and men, humanity, as mm -hmm. intelligent and free creatures have to journey toward their ultimate destinies by their free choice and preferential love. They can therefore go astray. And it goes on about how God respects our freedom. As in go astray from our destiny, as in not not reach our destiny to i mean the i think the idea of destiny from what i'm reading here in the catechism is more more so um i mean it's too it's kind of twofold it's most multifaceted for example you can look at number 1260 which says since christ died for all and since all men are in fact called to one and the same destiny, which is divine, mm -hmm. we must hold that the Holy Spirit offers to all the possibility of being made partakers of the Paschal mystery. So it's this idea that there is a calling to a specific destiny or end, but ultimately whatever destiny we end up at is our choice. Mm -hmm. so so the destiny that we are called to is union with god and um and that the catechism says the ultimate purpose of all of creation is that god who is the creator of all things may be at last uh may at last become all in all so there that's basically that's that's the the way that things are, everything is called to sort of like created for quote unquote, but everything was created in love and you can't have love without freedom because otherwise mm -hmm. that's, if you're in a controlling manipulative situation, that's not love. So that, that's, that's what makes it interesting is, you know, I think because Lucas came from a Presbyterian background that he pulled that in, right? He pulled that love piece in and mm -hmm. that selfishness and in, in the dark side um, is what sort of destroys that, you know, um, that light side, which is love. So like, there's a sense in which we all, we all have this, the same destiny that is to live 
fully in the love of God and, um, and like the, the things we think, like I'm, I'm thinking of, um, in, in, uh, school, I had a, a, a friend who is like desperately trying to figure out what if I marry the wrong person? <laughs> Mm -hmm. and, what if I open and, door number one instead of door number three, which God yeah. wants me to open? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And those, those like individual destinies that we have are like, are insignificant compared to the power of the destiny of love. <laughs> you know, that, that, that great destiny that we have in God. Um, our, our choices change like the the way we live our lives and where we end up in our lives but um and and they can change whether or not we reach the the love of god if we if we run away from god he's he's going to give us the freedom to do that but it doesn't change the fact that he is always calling us to him mm -hmm. and always inviting us to share in that love yeah this yeah. Oh, go ahead, Catherine. Uh, the the mistake that you talked about, oh, what if I marry the wrong person? That's what yeah, I loved, yeah. another Mother Angelica quote where she says, God is not going to abandon us if we make a mistake. He will always be there. So you, you may feel like you made a mistake, but if you're always seeking God and that ultimate destiny of union with him, he's going to help you course correct. He's not going to leave you out there. He didn't leave Peter out there sinking in the water called him up out of the storm and walk with me. So we always have that opportunity to reach back and grab his hand and get on the right path. Yeah. Like what I was um, going to bring up Catherine, but this worked out perfectly is, you know, you're an artist and in the whole uh, creation process, right? Like so many different variables are a part of that process, you know, and a good artist or a good creator knows how to work those variables in, even if they might not be part of like the initial plan A, but then it ends up being more beautiful, you know, in yes. the end. Yeah. Just had that happen with the piece I was starting to work on. I thought, oh yeah, this is the perfect font to go in this location for a chalice ball I'm doing and saw something else. And it was like, okay, change everything you just did put this in instead and then just it just happens and yeah there's times where I love you know just feeling like I've let go of control and it's like I want to do this with you Lord not me for you all for you and you go back and look at something I've painted or drawn and it's like who did that <laughs> it's just it's a nice feeling when you can say you let go, you know, like that great uh, surrender prayer. Well, it's like, you know, you want to do everything all in Christ's sacred heart. Which in a sense brings us back to, to Star Wars when, I, I mean, I'm thinking about how Luke puts his love for his friends and his love for his father ahead of what... Ben and Yoda are telling him he's supposed to do mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they're focused on the destiny of the moments like are you going to are you going to marry the right person are you going to <laughs> follow the right yeah you know, are you going to do your training like right now right now because training, you need to finish your training. your training yeah 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 mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah but he sees the bigger destiny that you know we are all called to the light of love of unselfishness in in star wars terms um you know the the love that overflows from god in in catholic terms and and we even see that through the sequel trilogy um with ray is just obsessed with what am i supposed to do what am i supposed to be mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then she just finally let's go it's like i all I know is I'm supposed to face Palpatine and Kylo Ren kind of has a, a, almost a mirror obsession and comes to the same conclusion that he's going to stand with Ray kind of no matter what. 
and um and it's when they let go of that control and just um yeah submit to the one thing they know about goodness about love that that this is the way that i can love my neighbor right now in this situation um yeah see the sequel trilogy ain't all that bad <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, so I, I mean, I definitely have so my nice. critiques of the sequel trilogy, but it um, it is clear that uh, everybody involved is continuing to build upon it, not to undermine it. Mm -hmm. And I say, give them a chance. I mean, I, I, I think it would be amazing if Dave Filoni can connect the dots in such a way as to give even the the mess of rise of skywalker meaning and context in in the star wars mm. universe and in the story um so uh, and maybe he won't maybe it'll continue to, <laughs> to be a mess i mean it's it's What's just a destiny? story <laughs> Dave Filoni, it is your destiny. <laughs> um, <laughs> to make it well, all make sense. balance. <laughs> I, I mean, bring the, the language that people use around mm -hmm. him is like, he is the true apprentice of George <laughs> Lucas. And so on. Yes. Um, uh, because after all, we're not here to have fun. Sorry. We're here to solve Star Wars, right? That's yes. what you said yeah, at the yeah. beginning. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I love um, the video Angela shared with us because the one thing I started focusing on was seeing Filoni sitting there while George Lucas is explaining the dark and light side of the force. Mm -hmm. and he looks like a little kid and he's got his little <laughs> sketchbook out and he's sketching away stuff and you can just see it's like, oh, that's where the truth came into it all. <laughs> it's like the little apprentice. <laughs> oh, man. But in the end, it is it is just a story. Um. And stories are, I mean, it's like you said at the top, you know, stories are really, they have power within them, right? For good or for bad, or for both, you know. Um, yeah. And, and we can pull a lot from them. So ultimately, I think most people who watch Star Wars will come away with that free will, your choices matter sort of, you know, message. In, in the face of a universe that seems to be uh, forcing things against that. Right. Um, that there's that hope. Freedom. Yeah, that there's hope. I'm um I'm thinking now of of uh the conversation that uh Tolkien um reports between himself and and C.S. Lewis and Lewis was complaining about myths and stories that they were all lies even if they were lies breathed through silver and um Tolkien turns it on its head. It's like, no, no, they, they're not lies. They are, they are makings by people who are made in the image of their maker. And none of our stories are going to be perfect or complete or have the kind of reality that, that we live in because none of us are God. None of us are that primary creator, but everything that we do is a making in the imitation of God who made us to be like him. And therefore there's something true and beautiful and good to be found in, in all of the stories that we tell. It's a little shadow of truth that we hope will keep us going in the right direction. It gives us the, uh, the freedom from fear to keep making choices and living our lives and, and figuring stuff out. 
I feel like you already wrapped it up in a bow. So what? Am, <laughs> I, feel like I, can't, I can't say I can't add to that. That's pretty perfect. <laughs> it's. I mean, I I love I love all our discussions on these podcasts, but this is yeah, this is like oh yeah, things are like clicking in my brain. And I'm just like, <laughs> oh yeah, this is this is really the way it's coming together is really beautiful for me right now. Um. Which I suppose means it's a good place to end the podcast. Um, <laughs> if you out there who are listening to us have more to add or, or thoughts about what we've been saying, um, we would love to hear from you um, about the force, about freedom, about the will of the force, the will of God. Um, drop us a line at Star Wars at sqpn.com. Uh, we're also on Facebook at StarQuest Media. Uh, we have a very active Discord server. Uh, you can get to that by going to our website, sqpn.com slash Discord and uh, getting your invitation there. Um, we'd very much like to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create The Secrets of Star Wars and all the other podcasts and all our other shows on StarQuest Media. In this episode, we would especially like to thank Robert P., Frank T., Nathan H, Anita H, and Wendy B. Uh, your generous support keeps the lights on here and keeps our microphones open. If you would like to join them in keeping our work going, please visit sqpn.com slash give. It also helps us when you subscribe or leave a review or something like that on any of your favorite podcast platforms. Um, we are on Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Spotify, iHeartRadio, lots of others. We even have an SQPN YouTube channel. Um, I think that's all for now. Until next time, Angela, thank you for being on the show with us. It was a pleasure. It was a lot of fun. I, I enjoy theological reflections on Star Wars such as this and look forward to more. Yeah, as do I. Um, and Catherine, thank you. It's been great to have you on. Thank you. I was glad to be here. You both have uh, given me a lot to think about, and so I am very grateful that you've been here sharing with me the secrets of Star Wars. Once again, I've been Robert King, and thank you out there for listening to the secrets of Star Wars on StarQuest. Here's another show on the StarQuest network you're sure to enjoy, The Secrets of Stargate. Find it wherever fine podcasts are found or at sqpn.com slash stargate.